Okay. So I'm very well, very welcome to all of you uh, to this seminar that we will be in together this afternoon. Uh, it's a little bit over three o'clock and uh, uh, there was almost 200 persons registered to um, to this meeting, so I guess people will trickle in and we'll get get uh, get get on with it. Um, okay, so my, my name is uh, Mikael Åberg and I'm head of the Uppsala part of the Affinity Proteomics unit, uh, and uh, this is a co-hosted seminar together with the SNPC platform in India in NDI Uppsala. And it will be about uh, mainly about Olink Explore, uh, this uh, multiplex protein uh, detection method that's been on the market for uh, a little over a year now. Um, and uh, this is the graphical abstract of the SciLife Lab Explore Lab, which is. Uh, the part of SciLife Lab that has the capa capacity to run this, uh, this as a service. And as you can see, it's a collaboration between two of, of, uh, of the units within SciLife Lab. And uh, back in 2020, we, um, when Olink launched this Explore, uh, we got a grant from the Swedish Research Council and also some money from SciLife Lab to set up this method. And in 2021, we were ready uh, and we launched the SciLife Lab Explore Lab. Uh, and you can reach us by different methods. There's a possibility through NGI's homepage, and you can find us also on the Affinity Proteomics homepage, or you can contact us directly through this email address that you can see uh, on the screen. Um, physically, if you choose to, to work with us, uh, your samples will be currently shipped here to the Biomedical Center in Uppsala. Uh, more, it's here in C11, you have the SciLife Lab entrance, and in Navet, uh, we will have um, down to the right behind the green stuff, the new lab that uh, we will actually go to a, a larger lab now will be located. And, uh, it's here where we will do the work. And the actual method, it's, it's a hybrid method. It's a little bit hands-on, but much, much of it is made by robots. And you can see three of the most important things here. Uh, we have the mosquito robot up to the left here, which is a nanoliter robot that makes all the dispensing in the start with the samples in different regions. And then you have the sequencer down to the left, uh, which does the, the final step, which is the sequencing that's unique for Explore. But to the right, you also have the staff, uh, the operators that are trained and certified and are the ones who monitor all of these processes from taking care of your samples when they arrive to making the final documents that you can use for extracting your data. So today uh, we're gonna talk, uh, we have a different, a few presenters uh, that will come along. And uh, one of the more important persons today is today's moderator, which will be Jessica Nordlund. And she's a researcher at uh, the Department of Medical Sciences, but also the director of NGI in Uppsala. Uh, and it's with a warm hand that I leave things over in your hands. So uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And uh, it's so nice to see so many people here today. So um, as you can see, we have a great uh, lineup of speakers for this afternoon. Um, next slide, please. Mike. Thank you. Um, and a couple meeting rules since we are a big group. So please stay muted during the presentations. And if you have questions, please write them into the chat. We're gonna take all of the questions at the um, Q&A session at the end. So if you send them into the chat, I will write them down and then uh, try to moderate the Q&A session. Um, and if you want to talk during the Q&A session, of course, you can uh, raise your hand as well. So please remember to do so. So without further ado, I think we'll move on. Uh, to our first speaker today from Olink. Uh, Nicholas uh, Tertipis is a molecular biologist with a PhD in medical sciences from Karolinska. 
And you've been working in several companies in the field of metabolomics and proteomics before moving to Olink, where now you work as the business development manager. And it is my pleasure to introduce your talk titled Olink Explore, Broader, Faster, and More Comprehensive Proteomics. So take it away. Thank you very much, Jessica and Mikael, for this uh, introduction and for letting all the participants know about your operations and how the organization is set up. And yeah, I'll, I'll start first. And thank you for the nice introduction, Jessica. And just let me know if you can uh, actually see my screen, if I find actually how to share. Yes, OK. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK, great. Then uh, I, I can start. As uh, you introduced my talk, uh, Jessica, yeah, we will be talking mainly today, not only me, but in general, about uh, the Explore platform and how actually uh, this, this uh, new platform uh, of uh, combining PA, as I will show you later, with next generation sequencing really enables uh, broader, faster, more comprehensive proteomics. Just a very uh, brief introduction about uh, Olink for those of you that we don't know, since we have participants from, from other uh, countries in the Nordics. So Olink uh, started actually from here, from the University of uh, Uppsala. And due to the proven execution and the high quality and data integrity that uh, has been offering to the scientific community and the researchers, has really now uh, established itself as the market leader in the field of proteomics. Uh, there has been really a rapid organic growth in just a few years. And as you will see in this map, uh, our headquarters are in Uppsala. However, we have expanded, as you will see, also in North America and in Asia. And we've been really humbled by the reception from, from the market and the uh, scientific community. And we're really proud by the fact that, as you will see here, we have uh, worked with all the major and prestigious academic institutions around the world. And we have established a strong uh, global network of thought leaders in many different areas. And uh, really, I want to mention here that uh, the technology is really backed up by uh, many, uh, as you can see, peer reviewed publications, which have now really surpassed the number of 800 in just a few years. So uh, how we work, as I said, we have established global relationships. And while we offer services, we now want to really externalize the technology and enable our partner labs and core labs, such as SciLife here in Uppsala, to actually offer this uh, technology in a broader spectrum and researchers that are interested in performing this for their uh, specific purposes. So, um, if I, uh, I may say that since everyone is here, I guess you all understand the, the importance of biomarkers and proteins specifically. I will just very briefly go through the central dogma as you can clearly see here. So um, really uh, proteins have the potential to complete the picture for the 21st century healthcare. And although there has been a lot of effort and investment in putting the DNA sequencing in the genomics area, uh, this has really enabled the findings of uh, like many different uh, genes and variants that are uh, associated with certain diseases or risk for certain conditions. However, we all recognize as the DNA is quite limited in their, uh, its actionability and actually is quite far from our profile and our phenotype. And while the RNA has been used as a proxy, really proteins uh, convey a lot of different functions within the cells. And uh, they're really, really important to be included in this uh, whole perspective of uh, the multiomics approach to uh, complete the picture, as I said. So they convey a lot of uh, different uh, functionalities and actions within the cell. And we all understand that they're very close to our phenotype and they're responsible for our phenotypic characteristics. And also the majority of the drug targets are really uh, proteins. So it's really important to have this very important layer of, of information in the new era of uh, healthcare. Um, 
just very briefly why scientists have been using uh, the OLINX products. So this is shown here in this, I mean, if I may say donut or pie chart. So this is to uh, better give the, the possibility to better understand the biology and the pathophysiology, to better predict the disease and disease outcome uh, for patient stratification and better disease categorization, uh, for the identification of surrogate markers for safety and efficacy in the wellness space, which uh, of course one can really see if there is a sort of a trend for uh, development of a certain condition and through changes in the lifestyle uh, they can be uh, possibly predict, uh, preventable and also uh, the identification of novel drug targets through uh, identification of peak inhales, the so-called protein quantitative trait low size where genomics and proteomics are combined with clinical phenotypic data and through Mendelian randomization can really enable the uh, identification of novel drug targets. So the, the platform or the technology can really support the complete drug development process from discovery, as I just said, with drug targeting discovery and PQTLs down to preclinical research and screening for biomarkers in other matters such as cells, for example, through the clinical development process and down to uh, the post-market uh, surveillance. And how this is possible is because the technology is uh, both scalable, but it can also become actionable. And when we say we talk about scalability, this is really the explore platform offered by Scilab, as we will see later on, which really enables the measurement of up to date 3000 proteins, but in the very near future, possibly up to 6000 proteins. So it really enables the discovery and any potential biomarkers or protein signatures can further be verified in subsequent cohorts, can be validated in uh, uh, other studies and cohorts and, uh, um, uh, and then lead down to possibly the clinical implementation with the development of LDT or IVD products. And I will show you how the technology really enables that. But we've been talking about the technology, so how this works and what is the basis of the platform. Uh, the platform is really based on the so-called proximity extension assay, where the best of the two worlds uh, are combined, meaning the affinity proteomics and the use of antibodies, together with uh, the really high standards and the complementarity that the DNA gives. So as you will see in this video, we have a matched pair of antibodies which is carrying a unique DNA tag and binds to the target protein. These uh, DNA tags are complementary, as you can imagine. So upon close proximity, they bind to each other. And this then is a unique barcode for a specific assay or protein. Any unspecific binding is done, so any signal. And then this um, amplicon is extended further and gives rise to uh, amplicons where they can, can be measured through qPCR, which is our target product, but what has really enabled us to uh, go up in multiplexing and enable us to measure 3000 proteins currently is really the combination or the readout of this whole um, procedure with next generation sequencing. So you really have your barcoding for the specific assays, but you also have the possibility of having sample indices. This is really is the possibility to read a lot of samples and all uh, uh, 3,000 assays simultaneously. And the multiplexing has gone up to 384. So uh, really with the PA technology, uh, there has been a lot of challenges that have been overcome and that have previously created some healthy skepticism in the field of proteomics. So for example, uh, the exceptional specificity is one of the hallmarks of the technology and of what we do. Uh, due to the dual recognition and the barcoding really allows for exceptional specificity. Then sensitivity is another point. Of course, the dynamic range, as I will show you later, which covers with the existing protein library 10 logs, the minimal sample volume, and of course, the high throughputness and the scalability due to the fact that we have uh, like combined forces with the next generation sequencing uh, readout. Um, 
The library, the current library, uh, covers all major biological pathways and processes. And we've been really uh, lucky that we have collaborated with thought leaders while uh, in the field of proteomics while designing the protein library. And this really enables researchers, as I said, in the scientific community to go from discovery down to protein uh, signatures, which can really help with their specific uh, research question or clinical uh, questions. So one minute. what is, yes, one minute. yes, yes, thank you. So Willing's scope is really to actually bridge the traditional proteomics and cover the broad uh, range of the plasma proteome and actually enable the measurement of low bundle proteins because there it is where we believe that the majority of the key scientific findings are hidden. So our scope is to actually have the entire or cover a broad range of the plasma protein. Explore 3072 uh, is uh, divided into eight different 384 panels, as you will see here, named after cardiometabolic, inflammation, oncology, and neurology. And one can really run the entire library or specific panels of interest that will serve the uh, scientific needs. So this is just uh, the whole portfolio showing how one from the discovery can go down, down to more targeted approaches with our targeted panels and the focus, the custom design panel. And again, we're really proud of our contribution to science and the fact that we have been working with many thought leaders around the world. And last but not least, really, uh, our vision is to, to enable a paradigm shift in the uh, global healthcare by giving high quality and effective tools for biomarker, protein biomarker discovery and development uh, for actually enabling the understanding of uh, real time human biology. And with that, I'll stop here. This was a very like brief overview and I'm happy to take any questions at the end of, of the whole seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for a great introduction into Olink Explore. Um, as uh, Nicholas said, please write your uh, questions if you have any in the chat or you can keep them until the end and we will address them um, with the entire speaker panel at the end. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Claudia Ferlini, who is a researcher and head of the Affinity Proteomics Stockholm Unit at SciLife Lab in KTH. And since 2021, you've also been the uh, coordinating the clinical uh, proteomics and immunology platform at SciLife Lab. Uh, Claudia has a broad knowledge of analytical methods ranging from mass spec to immunoassays, as well as experience with orthogonal approaches for biomarker validation. And today your talk is going to be about strategies for validating biomarkers and biofluids. So Claudia, take it away. Thank you. So yes, uh, my name is Claudia Fadolini and uh, as, uh, yeah, I was just thank you for the presentation. I'm the head of the Affinity Proteomics Stockholm and the coordinator of the Clinical Proteomics and Immunology Platform. So today I will just, uh, following what Nico say, I will just uh, uh, briefly introduce the concept of biomarker validation and which different strategies or methods can be applied for it. And uh, in particular, those that we have available at the Affinity Proteomic uh, Unit. So the Affinity Proteomic Unit is composed by two nodes today. So one node is in Stockholm and is hosted by KTH. I am the head and I'm supported by the scientific director, Jochen Schwenk. And the node in Uppsala, uh, which is like hosted by the Uppsala University, is headed by Michele Deberi and the director is uh, Masoud Kamal Mogadam. So we are complexively uh, 13 people uh, with a very broad experience and knowledge of cutting edge uh, affinity proteomic technologies. Uh, if we take a step back, we are also part of a larger community, which is the clinical proteomic and immunology platform, uh, which include uh, five uh, units uh, beside us in affinity proteomics. We also have the autoimmunity and serology profiling units which, which cover uh, in particular, the serology and the study of autoimmunity response. And we also have uh, uh, three units which, are, uh, which have expertise in mass spectrometry, both from the global point of view, and so global proteomic and proteogenomic analysis, and then 
targeted and uh, post-translational modification uh, analysis is covered by the glycoproteomics and it, we also have a site of uh, mass spectrometry uh, facility. Altogether, our dream is to create capabilities to offer users and collaborators the possibility to integrate the different technology to, have a deep, to uh, obtain a deep understanding of the clinical samples that they have available for the study and in the future eventually become available to uh, support the clinical decisions uh, in uh, healthcare. So uh, as already uh, introduced by Nicolaus, uh, um, when we discuss about discovery and application of biomarkers, we have to consider a long path, uh, which goes from yeah, the discovery step uh, that generally uh, starts with a um, relatively low number of samples, but uh, it's hoped to be very high multiplex to cover a higher number of proteins as possible. And then we have step of analytical validation and clinical validation before reaching the possibility of qualify and apply the biomarkers. Analytical validation and clinical validation are often considered together, but actually they face different challenges. So uh, when we discuss about analytical validation, what we are talking about, uh, it's a lot the assay itself and the, um, let's say, confirmation of the protein that uh, or, or the set of protein that has been identified as candidate biomarkers. So it has to do also with the sensitivity, specificity, and robustness of the assay. And uh, often in the analytical validation step, uh, we use orthogonal methods, which means that basically we try to compare uh, the biomarker that was discovered with a method with a second method to see if the data correlate and to understand if the discovery is really robust. And eventually we can also have uh, the possibility to perform a characterization of the biomarker or biomarkers ideally that are identified. Uh, then the step, when we step into clinical validation, which has to do more with the a number of, or like increase the number of samples uh, that are analyzed and then identify the bio or uh, assess the biomarker specificity and sensitivity in clinical terms and also the clinical utility. Then what we need is generally an assay that is uh, robust enough so that the two steps are um, connected. So we need to develop an assay that will be uh, clinically valuable uh, to apply in a larger number of samples. And eventually we reach uh, the qualification just if the uh, biomarker itself together with the assay, it's approved by regulatory authorities. So there are in literature many, many examples of uh, strategies uh, to discover and validate biomarkers in which different technologies are applied together. Uh, so here, if I want to mention uh, the case of the CA and IL-8 and prolactin uh, biomarker discovered in colorectal cancer, in uh, which the study involved the first screening with the link and then an analysis with the uh, a bit based uh, immunoassay for the development of a sandwich assay, but we also have the possibility, for example, to step up as Nico say, from an O-link uh, very high multiplex uh, assay to an O-link uh, low plex PA uh, for the validation. In general, uh, anyway, uh, the idea is that uh, starting from a large uh, screening high multiplex and high throughput uh, discovery. Uh, we select a panel of candidate biomarkers that uh, uh, show to be uh, meaningful and discriminate uh, like the different uh, um, uh, clinical group uh, um, in the disease of study, uh, and then uh, develop for it uh, a quantitative assay that can be used eventually uh, in clinic. So um, in the affinity proteomic uh, uh, unit, uh, we have uh, available a large portfolio of technologies, which involve, of course, a link and the possibility to run Explorer, as Nico uh, was uh, um, desc describing, for the, to, to obtain a very deep uh, discovery. And uh, we feature also other type of technology that we can use, uh, uh, let's say, as orthogonal method to uh, validate and compare with the link discovery and eventually to uh, develop uh, uh, sensitive and quantitative, quantitative, uh, quantitative assay. Uh, one, I mean, the Luminex bit -bay assay, bit -bay assay that we use, uh, it's uh, particularly useful because we can uh, um, perform a large screening of antibody and develop the novel uh, immunoassay for biomarkers for which a commercial assay is not, uh, I mean, uh, in the Luminex context is not available. And we can also, uh, we also have assays which are sensitive like uh, uh, the well-known Simoa from uh, Quanterix, which features uh, the 
a possibility to do a digital readout, which increase the, the dynamic range and the sensitivity of the assay, as well as the mesoscale based on electrochemiluminescence. And uh, not the least, uh, we have the possibility to run samples in very, like in a short hours, using our microfluidic system for protein simple, which is based on um, microfluidic cartridges uh, uh, in which the, uh, sensitive, uh, the specificity is given the possibility to perform different assays in parallel uh, in uh, several microchannels. So using together uh, all these technologies, our aim is to uh, support robust discoveries of uh, biomarkers and also eventually orthogonal validation and comparison between uh, different technologies. And uh, nevertheless, uh, thanks to the collaboration with our colleagues in the clinical proteomic and immunology platform, we can integrate this technology with the mass spectrometry eventually when needed, both global and target uh, in specific situations. Uh, I would like just to mention one last thing, uh, which is the, the fact that uh, recently we have been focused also on the analysis of home sampling, uh, um, on the analysis of samples which are uh, obtained by home sampling or self sampling, like for example, dry blood spot cards. And uh, um, these type of devices are particularly useful when, if we talk about uh, biomarker validation, uh, because they give the possibility to perform population study and validation of biomarkers eventually uh, in individuals which are not uh, available in clinical settings so that they don't reach the clinic and they prefer to be reached at home. And then you will increase the number of uh, negative uh, um, control individuals in the samples cohort, uh, but also the possibility to study the disease at different levels, not just in individuals uh, which are uh, in the hospital. Um, yeah, we are developing, we, are, we applied this type of devices both in Stockholm and in Uppsala for serology analysis, and uh, uh, we also have tested them uh, using Olink, for example, and uh, other technology, and we aim in the future to uh, expand this aspect for, for future studies. So if you, finally, if you want to contact us, uh, you can find us in the SciLife Club, the web page of Affinity Proteomics. And just to mention that Affinity Proteomic Unit is also part of the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine. We are part of the biomarker, their biomarker platform. And of course, you can contact Explore as an ESA, Explore as Thailand Lab, if you're interested in Explore in particular. And you can reach the whole platform and all the different units, uh, again, through the Thailand Lab page at the, under the Infrastructure Organization, where you can find the link uh, also to talk with our colleagues regarding uh, the other technologies. So thank you, and I'm happy to receive uh, any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Claudia. Very nice presentation. Um, yes, uh, please keep the questions coming in the chat. Um, so then it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, uh, Stefan Enrut is an associate professor in computational genomics at Uppsala University. Uh, his current research aims at characterizing and understanding factors that influence the abundance of human proteins and using this knowledge to develop personalized models for biomarker discovery in gynecological cancers. And today, Stefan is going to tell us about his journey and experiences with a, um, an early pilot study of two ovarian cancer cohorts on the Olink Explore platform. So take it away, Stefan. Yes, uh, so thank you very much, Jessica, for that introduction and for, for providing me with an opportunity to, to talk here. So uh, I will be moving into some uh, actual data that we've uh, that we generated and in relation to uh, ovarian cancer. So just a brief introduction on, on ovarian cancer, I thought would be maybe appropriate. So uh, ovarian cancer is uh, quite often called the silent tumor of the abdomen. So it's a it's a, it's a type of cancer that doesn't really manifest itself in symptoms, that it will grow uh, or develop sort of quietly, and it's not discovered until uh, a fairly late stage. So ovarian cancer is the second most common gynecological cancer with over 700 cases and 550 deaths per year in Sweden. And while if the cancer is discovered early, that is in stage one, let's say, we have a fairly good survival rate. So over 90% of the women will survive for over five years. But if it's discovered late, uh, the, the survival rate drops to around only 20%. And unfortunately, the large majority of cases are in fact discovered in the late stage. 
So meaning that the overall survivability over five years for ovarian cancer is uh, fairly low. Uh, so today's biomarkers uh, that exist for ovarian cancer, they're, they have two major problems. They're not uh, sensitive enough for early detection, meaning that there are lots of false negatives. And they're not also, also not uh, specific enough to rule out cancer if you have uh, symptoms in your, uh, but maybe not cancer. So the one that is used clinically today is called CA125, uh, which is a fairly poor biomarker, but it's the best one that we have. Uh, so I plotted out two rock curves here. The one to the left is for separating benign cases for early stages, so stages one and two. You can see that it only performs slightly better than a random guess, while it's fairly good for the later stages, so stage three and four. Uh, but if you look at the clinically used cutoff uh, for this biomarker today, which is at 35 units per milliliter, indicated by this large red dot, you see that the performance is actually not that good at all for the early stages, uh, and it's not, it does have a fairly low specificity also for, also for the late stages, so meaning that it's a rather poor biomarker overall, and it's affected by lots of different factors apart from, from the cancer. Uh, so there are studies uh, looking at personalized baselines where you doesn't, don't compare the cutoffs to yourself or to a, to a fixed cutoff, but rather monitor this development of the biomarker in your own versus your own personal baseline. But uh, the studies so far indicate that we would need to measure this um, biomarkers maybe three or four times per year to get good enough uh, measurement from this biomarker to be used clinically. And we can all think that if we were to, for instance, think about a screening program where you have to uh, give samples maybe three or four times per year would be unfeasible. So there is an, uh, an acute need for good and accurate biomarkers for early detection of ovarian cancer that would only suffice with measuring them once. Uh, so to this end, we uh, decided to do a pilot study uh, using the PEA Explorer. And we used two cohorts for this. So the, the one cohort we use as a discovery cohort is a cohort from uh, Salgenska University Hospital in Gothenburg, containing both benign tumors and malign tumors, uh, uh, just over 100 individuals, so 111. And then at, at the same time, we, used, we decided to include a replication cohort. So this time from the UCAN databases in Uppsala, the biobanks in Uppsala, with a, a matched distribution of benign and malign cases, but only in uh, 37 samples. So these two uh, <clears throat> samples were run on two plates on the PEA Explorer in uh, September, I think it was, last September. And as we heard Nicholas talk about, this will give you, uh, or gave us 1,472 proteins for each of these uh, samples. And we also included four samples uh, on quadruplets on each of the plates so that we can calculate some sort of uh, assay statistics on how well the technology was performing. So overall, we were very happy with the data. Uh, in, the, in the data we got back, there's a, a, a QC warning set or not set for each of the individual measurements. So, and in our case, over 90% in both of the plates passed this QC warning. So we got lots of data back from, uh, from our experiments. And in addition to this technical variance, there's also a limit of detection. And in our case, uh, more than 90% of uh, all the all the sample measurements, all the protein measurements, all the samples were, were above this uh, limit of detection, which we, uh, we were very happy with. So a great result in, in, for all of our data. Um, and there is also um, a warning on the protein level. So the previous QC measurements were on an individual level, but there's also uh, a QC step on, on a pure protein level. And in our case, there were nine proteins that were labeled with a warning, which correspond to uh, only 0.6% of all the proteins investigated. So a really good result on that part as well, we think. Um, and these were distributed quite uh, or as evenly as they could be across these four sub-panels that we heard Nicholas talk about. So the cardiometabolic panel, the neurology, inflammation and oncology panel, each had two or three proteins that were sort of labeled as uh, not passing the QC. So uh, overall, very happy with this uh, turnout as well. Uh, and if we're just do a quick comparison, so we've been working with all data for quite a while. And back in 2013, 
when we uh, uh, ran the Oncology 1 version 1 panel, a target 96 panel, we had 75% of the proteins passing QC uh, and limit of detection in at least 20% of, uh, of our samples. So this is a huge improvement for the uh, data that we've got uh, today from the, from the PEA Explore uh, compared to this, uh, well, a decade ago now. So if we look specifically at these four samples that we ran in quadruplets across each plate, uh, we calculated some correlation coefficients between all of the measurements that we had. And within plate correlations between these samples are extremely high. Uh, and they're also very high when we look between plates. So that was one of these samples that stood out a little bit, but overall we were very happy with these uh, correlation rates. Uh, so it looks really good uh, from that point of view as well. So uh, the final data that we got were 1,463 proteins. So we excluded these nine proteins that, did, that were labeled as a, a QC warning. We also excluded all of the individual measurements for individual proteins that were labeled with a QC warning. And we also took away all the measurements that were below the limit of detection. So that was our, our final data set. And the first thing uh, that we did was to do a univariate comparison in between cases and controls. And using very strict uh, statistics, uh, requiring at least a one NPX difference between cases and controls. So NPX is on a log two scale. So this corresponds to either doubling or half the, the concentrations in cases compared to controls. Uh, and we also used a, bon a strict Bonferroni adjusted p-value cutoff. So, so, so a fairly strict uh, statistical analysis. We found 32 proteins out of these uh, 1,463 in the discovery cohort. And when we looked in the replication cohort with the, precisely the same uh, cutoffs, uh, 28 of them replicated, even though the uh, replication cohort was very small. So the performance was very similar between the two cohorts. Uh, we also picked up uh, all of the sort of expected and known candidates. I've plotted out a few here. Uh, in, uh, panels B, C, and D, which are some of the most more common, uh, commonly known sort of proteins or genes to be affected in both expression levels and protein levels in ovarian cancer. And in those figures, the gray ones are the benign samples. And then you can see a progression that the concentration increases from stage one to stage two, three, and four for the, uh, for the malignant tumors. So the second thing that we did was to do a multivariate analysis where we tried to build a multivariate model for predicting if you had cancer or not. And in this case, we reverted back a little bit to using 175 of universally nominally significant proteins are requiring a p-value less than 0 0.05 and an NPX difference of 0 0.5. So a slighter lower requirement than in our univariate analysis. And we specifically were looking for models that could separate either the benign cases from stages one or two, so early stage, or benign versus late stage, or benign versus any stage, or early stage versus late stage. And for all of these models, uh, we've developed the models specifically in the discovery cohort only. So we used a feature selection and uh, an optimal uh, called, well, we used a GLM net or lasso and elastic net generalized linear models to both do feature selection and optimize our linear models. And they were optimized using a, a threefold cross-validation schema, but in the discovery cohorts only. And we also picked out a specific cutoff for, for malignancy uh, using the discovery cohort only. So that will give us a sensitivity and a specificity. And then we took the model and the cutoff, cutoff and applied it to the replication cohort. Uh, to see what the performance looked like there. So there was no information sort of going back and forth, no retraining of the models and no resetting of the cutoffs using them uh, straight as they were developed in the discovery cohort. And if we look for instance, for one of these models, the benign versus all stages, uh, the model was built on only five proteins and it achieved a, a sensitivity and a specificity in the discovery cohort of 0 0.92 and 0 0.96, which is an excellent result. And when we compare this to, to the, the replication cohort, we've got the sensitivity and the specificity of 0.75 and 1. And these are 
And so they looked like the point estimates are a little bit different, but if we look deeper into this, the confidence intervals are very overlapping. And statistically, there is no difference between the results. And the reason for this, I think, is that the replication cohort is fairly small. So the confidence intervals on the point estimates are a little bit uncertain. But the main thing here to, to maybe consider is that if we look in panel A over there, um, using the clinically measured CA125 in the same sample, so these are clinical measures, measurements done at the hospital for these patients, we outperform it uh, at a, at a very, with a very big difference. So we're much doing a much better job in finding the cases compared to the old biomarker and also compared to our old biomarker panel, called, which is in the figure called 11P, which consists of 11 proteins that we published a couple of years ago. So this looked really good with only five proteins. And then if we look in the bigger picture for all of these four models that we built, uh, they're all based on a very small number of proteins. So between three and seven proteins for each of these four models, with the total number of proteins uh, only reaching 11. So it would be enough to measure 11 proteins and then use these proteins in different ways to, to give us these uh, four models. And all of these models performed equally well, meaning there was no statistical difference at least in the discovery cohort compared to the replication cohort. And all of these models outperformed uh, both the clinical CA125 measurements and our earlier 11 uh, protein biomarker model. And in all of these cases, the performance is really high, except maybe for separating stage one or separating early stage from late stage, which is a fairly difficult a problem both for the for our modeling and the old models and for the uh, clinically used biomarker but overall this looks really promising with very good results uh, and I, I think that they are worth continuing with and, and replicating in a, in a bigger material so to summarize this uh, fairly quick and easy talk so technically we had uh, we think got very high quality data we were very happy with the, both the uh, turnout on an individual level and overall on the proteomics level when many biomarkers measure. Biologically, uh, all of the biomarkers that we found uh, sort of rediscovered the known biomarkers for ovarian cancer. And all of them made sense from a biological point of view. We also discovered and were able to replicate several new and potential univariate biomarkers uh, for ovarian cancer for early detection. And we also were able to piece together the multivariate analysis, several promising biomarker combinations, which were you know, where we achieved a really high accuracy for, especially for, for early detection. So with that, thank you for your attention. And these are our funding organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, for that uh, presentation. Um, I expect that we'll get a lot of questions in the chat now, so we'll take a look at those at the end session. Um, perfect. So, um, shall we move on to our next speaker, uh, Frederick Edvors? Are you here? There you are, Frederick. Hi. Um, so you lead the targeted proteomics group at KTH and SciLife Lab, and you have been one of the major contributors to the um, Human Protein Atlas, focusing on plasma proteomics using different methods, reigning ranging from mass spectrometry to affinity-based technologies. You did a postdoc at Stanford and Mike Snyder's group. And for the last two years, you've been working at Karolinska Institute with various precision medicine efforts. So today you're gonna focus on multi-platform approach for plasma proteomics and health and disease. And we're really looking forward to your talk. Welcome. Thank you, Jessica, for that lovely introduction. Um, I will focus on a project today called the Wellness a profiling project that's uh, been ongoing for several years. So I will show some examples from, from this project where we have run the old, old, old link 96 panels, but also reanalyzed a lot of samples in the new Explore, um, on the new Explore platform. But before starting, I would just like to put this into context why we're doing this. So conventional medicine, and uh, like we're talking about profiling people over time. And, most of the studies um, has gone from the conventional medicine type of performing medicine into more stratified type. We understand that people are different. We would like to stratify them into different groups, as Stefan showed with uh, different stages. But you, the true goal for precision medicine and personalized medicine is really focusing on the individual and longitudinal sampling. 
So, and this can be exemplified by body temperature, for example. The common belief is that 37 degrees is the body temperature of people. But when starting studying this in, in groups, you see that almost no one has 37 degrees as the baseline, and people are rather shifted away from that. So it's important to take subtitles and demographics and uh, the patient uh, in focus and then comparing that one against other similar uh, patients. What we would like to focus on with uh, the, the wellness profiling program is to start looking and tracking individuals over time. We do longitudinal sampling. Uh, Claudia showed some really nice examples in her presentation how to do blood sampling at home uh, where we can monitor clinical features and compare that to environmental changes, for example. Um, so a couple of years back, we started a multi -OMA, the multi-OMAX wellness profiling study, uh, a large study consisting of 101 subjects that were, were enrolled uh, from the SCOPIS project in collaboration with Jörn Bergström. And these individuals were followed for two years. And we performed continuous sampling of them every third month or sixth year in, during the second run. And uh, we managed to analyze them using a lot of different plat uh, molecular phenotyping platforms that are available through Scilab Lab. You can see here that we did RNA-seq of the PBMCs. We ran all the O-Link uh, target 96 panels at that time across all visits, which is a great foundation for biomarker identification and phenotype annotation. We did autoantibody profiling um, immune cell profiling using uh, the methods that Claudia also mentioned. We did gut marker uh, sequencing, but uh, we also ran LCMS metabolomics. Very interesting that we included a lot of clinical chemistry into this, so traditional blood tests that, that you run on real clinical samples, and then um, questionnaires and activity trackers, so we can really track the patients longitudinally over time. So when we, and this is also worth mentioning, that this is the qPCR data from Olink. So when we uh, assess the global proteomes across um, all the visits, plotting them in this UMAP uh, plot, visualizing uh, each individual um, over time as well. So each patient here is plotted um, six times. Um, and if they, uh, and also uh, each dot is connected with, um, and can you see my cursor here? Yeah. So each, so you have males and females visualized in different colors, and each patient's multiple dots over time is then connected with the line. So if the dots overlay, they, they are very similar to themselves over time. And if they move around, like here in the transcriptome, you, you're very similar to other persons over time than yourself. And interestingly, you can see that the proteome from the O-Link panel and the clinical chemistry shows clear separation of uh, males and females. And they also show that the patient's baseline is fairly similar, very stable over time, which uh, tell us that this is a really interesting source for information when looking over, or at samples, samples continuously over time. We can also do some interesting interomics correlations. And just one example here, we have APOB measured by clinical chemistry, which is a, a marker for poor cardiovascular health comparing that to the LDL receptor from the O-Link panel, showing a, a nice correlation. And all of this is published in this paper by uh, Abdullah Tabani. So please look into this if you want to see more uh, details about this. But the reason why I'm bringing this one up is because we ran this um, same um, panel or the, the same samples through both the O-Link 96. And now recently last year, we had the opportunity to run one Explore pilot and then see how uh, the data behaved in both different um, settings. And this is work done by Lin and Wen and myself. So I will continue, just go ahead and present some of the insights that we could gain from these extended panels uh, that we had uh, the possibility to run. So just looking at the healthy proteome, one can see that uh, the inter-individual uh, variation um, within um, well, is much larger between patients than within the same patient. And uh, you can see here in the high, highlighted um, um, gene names that uh, the qPCR ones uh, highlighted in 
purple um, and the normal ones from added by all link explore spread out all across so you add a lot of biological information by transitioning from the qpcr based platform to all link explore we can also do um a pqtl analysis and we could um, identify 321 independent genetic variants with a new link explore assay out of which 69 were novel for this um, this data set at that time of publishing um, interestingly we could also do similar as stefan presented uh, some um, correlation analysis to see how big the cross-platform correlation was and we could see that most of the assays the majority of them had really high cross-platform correlation uh, across all visits um, and we also included a type 2 diabetes um, arm of this study so we actually added some per two per two patients but that's uh, another story i won't uh, get into that uh, during this time uh, you can see here uh, for example, you have uh, the MPX values on, on the next gen uh, sequencing, so they wouldn't explore on the y axis, and the MPX from the qPCR and all samples analyzed with both assays line up really nicely with the Pearson R of 0.96. So this is one fibro, uh, uh, one uh, um, FGF F21 receptor. And um, another protein here, PROC1. It's very specific for both uh, males and females. Also line up very nicely along the y-axis, showing the same result across both platforms. If we do pairwise global uh, Pearson correlation across all samples, you see that they also, in like almost confirming Stefan's observations, that the correlation is really high across platforms if you compare the, the scaling on the MPX values on the global scale. And you can see that the same proteins behave the same over time as well in the patients, uh, both on the um, next gen sequencing data and the qPCR data. And they are just colored in different ways here with female males uh, down here. And these are just individuals, individual samples up here, which is really astonishing to see when you transition from, uh, from two different workflows like that. The fold changes between um, the two methods also stays the same. So looking into the minimum and maximum value of each uh, protein, kind of catching the biological variants or like the ability to catch biological variants. If you're using QPCR version, NGS stays the same. And uh, you can see um, uh, that the, the full changes between males and, and females here are reproduced in both, um, both the QPCR assay as with the NGS, all of the samples lining up along the diagonal. So with this in mind, we, we're very happy with the result from the initial, uh, the initial study and uh, realized that this is something that we would like to pursue and continue working with. So we took it at HPA, headed by Matthias Ulen, and then in collaboration with the Sailaf Lab facility, uh, Jessica and Mikael, we decided to uh, try to create one of the world's most comprehensive maps of human disease across hundreds of diseases to use this as a foundation to explore common molecular features for certain diseases, and then uh, use the Olink Explore data to allow for further in-depth um, depth exploration. So we started the Disease Atlas a couple of uh, years back and are just now in the middle of the analysis um, pipeline. And this is a plot showing the abundance of plasma proteins. It's a pretty old, link plot. Uh, and you can see that proximity extension, as I say, historically has been um, focusing on the low abundant plasma proteins, while mass spectrometer has been targeted to the higher or the, the most abundant plasma proteins. But with Olink Explore, these proteins start stretching up here to the higher abundance rates. And even with the Olink 3000, you reach all the way up to the high abundant lipolipid protein. So it's supposed to be a great overlap with uh, the next generation or with the latest release of the Olink 3000 assay. I have only analyzed uh, the 1536. So the data I will show here is only on the 1536. But we ran the, the we've started analyzing uh, approximately 3000 samples. Uh, through the pipeline, and we have gotten really far with the Olink Explore. Uh, the mass spec is a little bit lagging behind since it's a serial injection and it's not as paralyzed as the Olink Explore, which is a huge benefit. 
The benefit, however, with mass spectrometry is that you get uh, is that you can get absolute quantities using internal standards. You can actually get um, concentrations from from this, and not relative con concentrations or abundance as with Olink Explore. So I will just show you some overlap. This is very uh, preliminary results, but some some um, abundance plots where we compare the two assays, and you have link uh, on the x-axis and targeted proteomics on the y-axis and um, they are supposed to quantify the same protein and we're really happy to see that most of them show a positive correlation um, quite high sometimes all, all the way up to above 0.85 um, in the in the peptide specific plots and this is the average across multiple peptides as well but you can see the, the proteins here that are ordered by abundance. So AMBP is one of the highest abundant proteins uh, in blood, down to von Willebrandt factor, which is one of the lowest abundant proteins for the mass spectrometer to measure. So this is not the highest one that, uh, uh, the highest one that um, the protein. Okay. Sorry, well, let's see. So, um, so uh, yeah, so the highest one, AMBP, and the lowest one on Willebrandt, that's not the lowest one for uh, Oling, it's rather like in the sweet spot for, for the parallel extension assay. So uh, you can see that correlation uh, follows this, make this turn. So you have poor correlation for the high abundant proteins, go like increasing to kind of when the two methods meet, and then mass spectrometry is probably quantifying the targets um, at a much lower precision as you get, get deeper and deeper down into um, the concentration range. And uh, this can also be verified by uh, the, the correlate, if you correlate the O-link result against all peptides quantified using towards the AMBP, you see poor correlation across all the cases, while there's a good intracorrelation between all the peptides covered by AMBP. Another um, interesting pro protein here is APOM, which is almost as abundant uh, as AMBP, and they actually show good correlation across platform. Um, but it, this could also be due to different epitopes and where the protein binds. So we, we don't really know yet uh, why we see these, uh, these effects, but it's most likely antibody or peptide dependent. So as a summary, uh, we can conclude that uh, both pan platforms, the QPSR and NGS, give, has really high quality data and that they are comparable and uh, that we could quantify and detect the same PQTLs on both platforms regardless, but while the NGS actually gave us more hits, of course. And uh, I would just also like to open up and connect this data with what uh, Claudia presented, that orthogonal validation is possible when you have your biomark. And this is really, really important to pursue when you ha have a list of targets that you want to quantify further. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I can take questions uh, by the end of the talk. Thank you so much, Frederick, for a great presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the questions that are asked of you later. So, and also thank you for uh, staying on time. So now we're actually back perfectly on time and it is my pleasure to introduce our last uh, speaker pair of the day. So this talk is gonna be a joint presentation uh, between Sandra Helberg, who is a postdoc in uh, translational bioinformatics at Linköping University, who is a medical biologist working with bioinformatic analysis of large scale data and multi-omics integration. And together with uh, Professor Ingrid skelton kockbom who is a professor at Karolinska Institute with focus on genetic epidemiology of multiple sclerosis, we're going to hear a talk about disease-associated module enrichment and pre-analytical considerations for robust biomarker discovery. So we're very much looking forward to hearing this talk. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Um, yes, we so, can. Yes, so thank you so much for the invitation to come here and present some of our preliminary data where we have used the Olink Explore platform to uh, look for biomarkers in multiple sclerosis. And the talk will be divided into two parts. Uh, so I will start by discussing 
uh, a bit about the things that we have done regarding the CIS modules, and then Ingrid will take over and talk a bit about pre-analytical considerations. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the screen froze. Um, so MS is a chronic inflammatory disease um, uh, of the central nervous system, and it's uh, characterized by the presence of uh, inflammatory lesions that are caused by an infiltration of peripheral immune cells that target the myelin sheets that surround the axons. And for most patients, the disease starts in a relaxing remitting manner, but then over time, as damage to the central nervous system accumulates, the disease moves into a more progressive phase where you have a steady increase in disability. And it's known that the events that take place very early on, probably even before the diagnosis, are very central for determining the disease course. So a lot of effort has been put into trying to identify uh, biomarkers that can explain different aspects of the disease. Where cerebrospinal fluid has been the primary source for biomarker discovery because it's closest to the target organ, so it might more accurately actually reflect what's going on in the central nervous system. And it's also been easier to find more robust changes between patients and controls. And there are a few biomarkers, like for example, the presence of oligoclonal bands that are used in clinical routine. Uh, and then there are other uh, more recently discovered um, proteins that uh, uh, hold potential for the future. Um, and then a lot of effort has also been into discovering uh, biomarkers in blood, because of course, blood is a more easily accessible tissue, so it's less invasive, invasive for the patients. Uh, but it's been quite challenging because the differences in blood are much more subtle. But with the development of techniques like the PEA, now we have the possibility to actually hope that we will be able to discover biomarkers in, in blood as well. So this is a multi-center collaboration between Karolinska and Linköping University, uh, where we are analyzing uh, paired plasma and CSF samples from different cohorts of MS patients that reflect uh, different aspects of disease, where the aim is to identify biomarkers that can be used, for example, for prognosis. Uh, so we have one cohort of patients with early MS that reflect disease at the very earliest stages. And then we also have uh, patients with more progressive disease and also healthy controls. And this is just a schematic of the analysis pipeline that we have used so far. Um, so after differential expression analysis, we validate the results using uh, enrichment of disease-associated genes and proteins that are derived from different sources. And this then serves as kind of like a guide for, for the downstream analysis where we're using networks and disease modules, uh, which I will explain uh, shortly. So I will only present the results today from the, the early MS and healthy controls. Um, and the idea here is to be able to identify changes that occur very early on during the disease to be able to, for example, find uh, prognostic uh, biomarkers. And principal component analysis shows, kind of as expected, that we can see that in CSF there is a clearer separation between patients and controls, but it's not as clear as um, in, in plasma. And differential expression analysis actually shows that there are no proteins that survive uh, FDR, neither in plasma or CSF. Uh, and that's most likely because the changes we're looking for are not pronounced enough to survive the, st the strict requirements uh, of FDR, uh, which is quite common when you're, you're analyzing so many proteins at once. However, we do see that there are a lot of proteins that are nominally differentially expressed, both in plasma and CSF. And in CSF, we can see, for example, that there are a lot of known um, proteins that are associated with MS that are among the ones that are most differentially expressed. Uh, so we have uh, continued working with these results and we have uh, validated the relevance of these changes using um, different sources um, connected to, uh, for example, risk genes that are associated to MS that are derived from GVAS, and also uh, a compendium of genes that are collected through DISGENET, as well as known um, MS bio biomarkers. And then we have checked if our uh, differentially expressed proteins are enriched uh, for any of these. Um, and as expected, we can see that CSF is more significantly enriched uh, for MS-associated changes, uh, but also for example, plasma shows a slight enrichment in MS-associated risk genes. Um, so this kind of shows that even though we cannot rely on FDR, the changes that we're picking up are still um, relevant for disease. And this has then served as kind of like a starting point for our downstream analysis, where we have uh, investigated the data further using disease modules. So 
So what we know is that the function of a protein is not defined by itself, but it's actually defined by which other proteins it's interacting with. And it has been shown that proteins that are functionally related, they actually tend to co-localize in the protein-protein interaction network, and they form uh, what is called functional modules. So it's basically a cluster of genes uh, or proteins that, for example, belong to the same biological pathway or the same signaling cascade. And this has also been shown to hold true for disease-associated genes and proteins, so they also tend to co-localize within the protein-protein interaction network. And of course, in complex diseases like MS, uh, where we're, we know that it's not one protein that causes the disease, but most likely uh, where it is a combination of multiple factors that contribute to disease, uh, then disease module becomes a very powerful tool because we're leveraging the information from many proteins instead of just focusing on the importance of a few. So in a disease module, it can be that the effect of an individual protein on the disease is not very large, but the combined effect of all proteins could have a huge impact on the disease and play a, a huge role in the disease pathogenesis. So one can kind of view disease modules as a way to organize and prioritize the disease-associated uh, proteins. And then these modules can, of course, be, uh, be validated in different ways using, for example, um, disease enrichment, as I talked about before. And the models can also be uh, um, explored using pathway analysis. So you can get like an overview of, okay, which are uh, the, the disease mechanisms that are central in, in the disease module. So we have applied this concept to our, our data. Uh, so we have inferred disease modules from our nominally differentially expressed proteins that we got from CS7 plasma. And as you can see, the resulting disease modules contain not only the proteins that are nominally differentially expressed, but it's also picking up other proteins that were measured in the um, uh, Explore platform as well as other proteins that were not measured, but that can serve um, as a pool, for example, to, um, for more proteins to be measured or to find other biomarkers or other, um, for example, therapeutic strategies. Um, and we have again used um, disease-associated enrichment as kind of a way to validate that uh, the disease modules are still relevant for disease and even more so than, than before. So, the, the gray bars kind of show the enrichment um, without using modules. And then we can see that in all comparisons, the enrichment actually increases so that the disease modules are actually enhancing the disease signal in the data. And we're now planning to, to go back and uh, divide our cohort into a discovery and replication cohort because this is just scratching the surface so far. And um, so then we'll be able to do more robust validation uh, of the data. So in conclusion, uh, plasma still remains uh, quite challenging, but um, uh, with techniques like PA, we can actually detect disease-associated changes in plasma as well. And disease modules are a powerful tool for biomarker discovery, uh, especially in complex diseases where we can actually leverage the information from multiple uh, proteins. And we could see that using disease module, modules actually strengthen the disease-associated changes in our data. And um, we believe that this provides a solid foundation for, for further analysis. And now I will leave the word over to Ingrid for the second half. Thank you. I shall share my screen. So, um, oops. Uh, yes, so I'm going to show some data that we have published in an article regarding uh, the effect of uh, how you handle the samples before you actually analyze them in this, uh, for proteomics. Uh, so the background for this was partly um, a lack of, in the past, as you probably have partly touched upon today, uh, problems with um, biomarker identification and also their replication. And one of the issues that could potentially uh, make things complicated is a lack of a consistent handling of samples. Uh, and that might, might have quite some implication on the data. And we actually found that in another study, which motivated us to try and test how, what the implication would be in a more systematic way. 
So of course, we all think that we handle our samples very systematically, that we collect them and freeze them very quickly, uh, that we keep them frozen until we analyze them and after we thaw them uh, carefully before we actually analyze them. But that may not always be the case, especially if you're looking at samples that have been collected at different clinics, for example, where not, maybe not the same routines have been used. So our question was, how big effect could this have on the, uh, on the level of protein that we estimate with link methods? So the study has been published in molecular cell proteomics. Um, I will jump over this here, but I will go through how we set it up. This is a very small study. I'm used to doing genetics where we look at tens of, tens of thousands of individuals, but here we're actually looking at very few. In this case, there are six cases of MS and six healthy controls. I'm sorry, they seem to have disappeared behind the tube there. Uh, we took a EDTA blood, we let it stand for different amounts of time at room temperature before centrifugation and uh, freezing of plasma. Uh, and the plasma samples were then uh, thawed once to be allocated before they were shipped for um, a link analysis. And for the plasma, we ran the inflammation panel. So this is not the new, this is the targeted panels. Uh, we also did the same thing for CSF, where we had two MS patients and two individuals who suspected MS that turned out not to be MS. Uh, and here we only had two time points, one hour and six hours. Uh, and then all of these samples were analyzed. Uh, in this case, they were analyzed on the inflammation, metabolic and your exploratory panel, and for the plasma, only the inflammation panel. And if we start with the plasma results, um, we then compared uh, the levels at baseline. So that was within one hour of sampling. And the reason we had one hour was because our clinic is situated a little bit away from the lab. So it takes uh, up to an hour before the samples are handled uh, after they're taken. Um, we compared the levels at one hour after taking them to longer times up to um, 72 hours of standing at room temperature. And as you can see in this graph here, there is quite a substantial change for many of the proteins, some of them up to tenfold change within the first 24 hours. And this could potentially be due to, most likely it's due to cell lysis and leakage of intracellular proteins. It could also be hemolytic factors that might be autocatalytic. And some targets um, show, most targets show a fairly linear change over time, but some of them a more dramatic change after a while, like for example, IL-8. Um, some proteins show a decrease in their level, like CXCL1 over time. Um, we also observed that the changes were quite systematic between uh, samples, so that pointed us towards thinking that we could probably model this. So here are some examples where the levels uh, have changed over time have been modeled with different models. So we used three different um, statistical models, linear, exponential, and Gompert, um, and here we present the best one for each one of them, one in healthy individuals and one in MS cases, but it's not so different in the two. Um, we also try to validate this finding. So there was a, has been a previous study by Shen et al, where they looked uh, at shorter times when samples were standing at room temperature. But these are shown in green. So we used the, the models I showed you in the last slide to predict how long the samples had been standing at room temperature, and then we compared to the actual time they've been standing. And in green, you see this other data set, which was performed at a different lab at the uh, KI Biobank. And in black, you see the samples that from our own lab. And as you can see, we can predict fairly well, although it's of course looking better in our own data where we, where we develop the models compared to the data from a different lab. But in most cases, it's a fairly good fit. Um, then we looked at if in the different um, targeted panels uh, from Olink, what which protein can best predict 
uh, handling time, so how long the sample has been standing around. Uh, and this analysis we did in samples from 28 healthy individuals with 12 different panels. And we did this by correlating to the already known uh, CD40L, which is known to be very sensitive to sample handling before centrifugation. Uh, it's a platelet-derived cytokine. Um, and the table below, you can, at the bottom, you can see the correlation for the best free markers from each panel. And the reason we're showing this is because we think that might be very useful for people to check whether they actually have a problem of sampling handling, because the reason we did this study was that we discovered we had a problem that we were not aware of. And um, so uh, it may well be that other people have similar problems and looking at some of the published associations, we think that is quite likely. Um, then we did the same thing in CSF. Of course, here we only have two time points, but still uh, we see, we also here looked both at cell-free CSF and whole CSF. Uh, we see that uh, there is less problem with uh, sampling handling. If you, the y-axis here has a quite a different scale than was what I showed for the plasma. Um, uh, and here most, there is, roughly equally many proteins that are increased as decrease in, in their concentration, whereas in plasma, most of them increase with time. Um, uh, there are also some um, proteins that increase both in plasma and CSF, and that's, for example, CCL19, CXCL6. Um, and this, um, yeah, can leave there. So in conclusion, Sample handling matters, especially for plasma, and it's probably something we should take into consideration when we look at our results. Um, most of the affected proteins are intracellular, uh, and the likely involved process is, hem is hemolysis, secretion of cytokines after stimulation from bioimmune cells, as these uh, samples are standing around and also potentially uh, degradation by proteolytic enzymes. And for CSF, one factor that we think is likely to contribute is blood contamination in the sample. Um, we have identified a set of markers from different panels that can be used to test if there has been an issue with sampling handling. Um, and we propose a process where you adjust for the differences in sampling handling by first approximating where, how long the samples have been standing around using the, the uh, models that we pre uh, present in the paper. And then you could then correct the other proteins in your panel uh, by using this estimated sampling handling time so that you have a corrected analysis. An alternative approach might be just to take away those samples that are known to be sensitive to sampling handling, but of course then you lose a lot of data. But on the other hand, then when it comes to moving towards clinical practice, that might be useful anyway, because those are the ones that are most likely to be robust in the long run for uh, application in clinical setting. Um, yeah. I should say that this study was almost entirely performed by Jesse Hung, who is a PhD student in my group, who's about to defend his thesis, uh, but also Mawson, Ariane, Thomas, and Fredrik were involved, and you see our funding as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, to both of you, Sandra and Inga, for a great uh, joint presentation. And um, now it is my pleasure to, um, I could say it's like start the question and answer session. Um, so quite a few questions have come into the chat. So I was thinking I'll moderate those first. And then um, if there are any other questions come up, just raise your hand and um, you can um, ask them yourselves. So the first question that came in, and I believe this is uh, directed, and I would direct this to my uh, Mikkel and Claudia, is how do you use the Samoa assays to validate PEA on O-Link? Yeah, I can, uh, I can answer. Of course, it's, I mean, it's a very good question because O-Link uh, starts with the profiling of a very high number. You would apply Samoa 
once you are at the stage in which you have selected a few uh, biomarkers of interest. Like for example, Stefan was uh, showing uh, that he has uh, uh, small subpanels. So this is the situation in which you would use him. Of course, you won't use that uh, if you aim still to do an analytical validation on, and you want to, for example, repeat the experiment, then you need a, another technology with a similar level of multiplex. Or if you want to go to higher, the highest level of multiplex that CIMOA doesn't handle, because CIMOA is uh, today up to 10, and for home uh, brew assay, it stays around the three so far. Uh, of course, in that case, maybe one can choose another uh, platform, like Luminex, it's uh, high multiplex up to 40, so yeah. In quanti and we are talking about quantitative assays in this case. So it depends on what the one wants to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And what do you think about the sensitivity between PEA and Luminex? I think they are uh, like similar. Of course, it depends on the target. Uh, it's very protein dependent and also antibody dependent, of course. So uh, generally, I would say that they are comparable. Uh, but it's case by case. Yeah, I would say the same. And if I, I may add here, as uh, Claudia said, uh, the sensitivity is comparable. However, uh, lower like uh, fold changes can be detected with uh, the PA and Oling, like two fold changes, while for Luminex might be between uh, five and 50 uh, mm -hmm. fold changes that can be detected. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, Nicholas, I think you can uh, continue because there is a question about yeah, yeah. the expansion to the 6,000 proteins. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about that? Of course, yeah. Actually, this was a number just to show that yeah, we're continuously looking after expanding our protein library. The main aim is to actually have this um, expanded at uh, 4,500 proteins towards the end of the year. And of course, we always want to, to aim for high numbers but this is the, the reachable target by the end of the year. And of course, we want to keep all the time our high quality standards. So yeah, I hope this, this answers uh, the, the question from you and Juan. Mm -hmm. And if I may comment on the next question, I think I mentioned briefly during my presentation, but I think Frederick really uh, saw a very detailed uh, graph how they compare and actually there are some overlapping but of course PA or uh, the explorer is more focused towards the low abundant proteome while MES is more on the like higher abundant proteome and um, the more uh, like and that's why I mentioned the more traditional proteomics in my slide so this is where they come together and complement each other. Mm. I'm wondering if Frederick has anything to add there I don't know if he's still with us. He's muted, maybe we can uh, ask him if he comes back on later. Um, did anybody, either of you from the Proteomics Silex Lab platform have anything else to say about the PEA versus uh, mass spec question? Oh, there you are, Frederick, hi. Oh, hi, sorry, yeah, so uh, I also just, sorry for uh, shutting down my camera. I, I definitely think that the mass spec is um, like the starting point, or has been the starting point for, for biomarker discovery, but with the growing uh, number of uh, analytes being available or made available by, by Oling, I definitely think that that is starting to shift. Uh, now when you can get 1500 uh, proteins or 3000, now you're talking about 6000, like then you'll be starting out with a smaller set of uh, these more expensive assays and then most likely progress with the target 48 or something in the end or making custom panels. But mass spec is, of course, if you have the, the money to invest in a mass spec or using a facility as a researcher, that's, of course, cheaper. But you will be mining the, the high abundant proteins. And if you start doing fractionation, it will take so long, so long time to dig, dig deep into the nitty gritty low abundant proteins that might be of interest, while also introducing biases with these fractionation methods. But yeah, they can complement each other, but you have to understand what you're going for in that sense. Thank you. And uh, Mickey, did you have something to add? Yeah, just one or uh, two things here. Uh, one thing to consider, maybe Frederick, you can also help me out here. But if you want to do like a 10 to 15,000 protein, uh, sorry, sample study, <laughs> uh, I don't know, Ulink can do that, but is mass spec, is it possible to do it today? 
I'm not depending like with you if, if we're talking about these discovery studies when you want to do fractionation and dig deep into the plasma protein for example then I would say no that would just take too much time you could of course do TMT and try labeling stuff but then you start uh, missing data and you get the missing data problem in, in, like in the end uh, targeted mass spec when you add standards yes but then you're bound to the top uh, two, 300 proteins. Uh, so if you want to study the cy cytokines or interleukines, you have to go with some sort of antibody-based technology in order to get through it. Just running 10,000 samples would take a year on one mass spec as well. So that's also time difference and you get the drifts and stuff uh, built into the model there. So I would strongly uh, agree against that, mm -hmm. even though I'm yes. doing that myself. So, and actually there was a question later on, I think that it fits well now. It talked about the throughput about of uh, Olink Explorer. And Mickey, maybe you can comment on how many samples are, can we run per week? It depends. Okay. <laughs> it depends if there's a pandemic or not. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, you see there are, I mean, if you're talking about the 3K panel or if you're talking about one single 384 panel, so if you want to do one single 384 panel, we will soon be able to run eight of those per week. Um, but since, um, I mean, and, and then if you run a, a 3K panel, that would mean only one, since it's one plate of samples per week, since it's uh, eight 384 web panels in one 3K panel. Now, this might not be that impressive, but if, if you look at the amount of data points produced, it's it's kind of, <laughs> it's staggering almost to see what you can produce in, in one week for these eight, eight samples. So the thing, if you wanna go big, uh, have a higher throughput, you need to add more analysis lines. Um, and we have the opportunity to do that lab space wise, and we're just waiting for the right project. <laughs> yeah. So we that. planned accordingly when we moved into our yeah. new lab now. So we will have ability to expand if it's needed to be. Okay, thank you guys so much. I hope that that answered some of the questions. So I'd like to segue into uh, Stefan's uh, talk. There were several questions. So Stefan, um, the first one was talking about the throughput, which we covered here, but the next question I think maybe you can address is a clinically friendly analysis. Yeah, well, uh, I guess if, if you if you think about the, 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 the steps needed before it, so you have to take, if, if you want to do screening, for instance, and you wish to base that on a blood sampling step, then it's, I guess it's not that clinically friendly. Uh, I guess it would be a much better option if we could screen or, or use these uh, methods in, for instance, self-collected dried blood spot or some other bodily fluid that you can collect yourself um, to sort of remove this, this step where you need somebody from healthcare uh, environment to actually draw your blood because that's a, a, a costly step, but timely, both timely and in pure money and also from the time needed to invest it by all the patients or all the people that you're going to screen. Uh, but uh, uh, whether or not it's a, cl a clinically friendly uh, technology. I guess it depends on where what you compare with. If you compare to to radical surgery, for instance, then it's very clinically friendly to do a, a blood test. Uh, so I guess it, dep it depends. Oh, but yeah, it's Mika's favorite answer. So I, I'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And then there was the next question um, was about the um, you didn't notice any variation of the cutoffs from the pilot project. Um, um, well, maybe that's a, a bit quick on that. So, so uh, I meant to say that we didn't change the cutoffs between the valid, for, between the discovery and the replication cohort, because in this case we were running all the samples in one go. So even though it's not absolute concentrations, the, the levels are comparable because they're analyzed at the same time. Um, so we wanted to see what kind of performance you would get if you if you develop the model in one cohort and then apply it as is in the second cohort without sort of fine tuning the the cutoffs uh, or the model coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, I guess what I meant. Yes. And then there's a second part of that question about if you um, have plans to apply this to a larger sample uh, cohort. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, ovarian cancer is part of this human disease atlas project, so we are currently running more samples. Um, 
rather than sort of have a bigger sample set to complement our previous investigations. So we will have overall more samples to get better statistical justification, I guess, for, for our findings. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then uh, the next question is, Stefan was also to you, and it had to do with the correlation of the identified proteins at the RNA level. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so, so we don't have RNA measured uh, for our patients or characterized, uh, but that would require sort of going into the, so the biopsies to find the tumor tissue, I guess, to do sequencing on it. And from a screening purpose, um, that's not our sort of end goal. So it would be even more clinically unfriendly to use uh, uh, tumor tissue to, to screen for, I guess. Uh, but then if we want, to, I've compared the, the results that we have with this, um, the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, program, I guess they call TCGA, where there are several um, or very big data sets for ovarian cancer with gene expression. And they put out a list of genes that are differentially expressed between normal and tumor tissue. And just looking at the overlaps with the O-Link, uh, with the PEA Explore panel, so that the total overlap between those two lists are 41 proteins and genes. And out of those, one gene or one protein overlap with our differentially expressed proteins and the univariate analysis, which is exactly the amount of, or the, exactly the number of genes that you would expect just by chance. Mm -hmm. So um, I, do, I don't think that there is necessarily a big uh, correlation between the RNA levels and the protein levels. I think we're looking at leaked protein, and I'm not really sure the, the underlying mechanisms of where these come from. Um, if it's from the tumor, or if it's in the microenvironment, or if it's a reaction with the surrounding cells, I'm not, I'm not sure. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would expect there to be a big correlation between, between the differentially expressed genes and the, and the, and the circulating proteins. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you uh, for that answer. I think we can segue over to Ingrid. Um, I have several questions to, to you. Um, for example, have you investigated similar effects using dried blood spots? It's a very simple answer, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, not yet, but that would be interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. um, are you uh, maybe planning on doing it now after you've gotten the question or <laughs> a little bit outside of your... Uh, uh, we don't have samples on blood, uh, on dried blood spots yet, so we don't have a reason to do it for that reason, but it, certainly I can see applications in the future where it would be very useful. So yes, maybe we will do it. And then the next question um, was if you've published your sample preparation effects on protein biomarker measurements. Yes, we have. It's published in Molecular Cell Proteomics 2021. And if you want to, I can send the reference. It's actually in, in the presentation. So if you take a look at the recording, which I think is going to become available, you'll see it there. Yes, it should be up in yes. one to two days. Um, and then we have another question to you, um, where do you think that the significant changes in plasma protein levels could be already detected in one to two hours? Um, and in that case, can your proposed model correct for such a sh short time span? Yes, so in the validation core, the one that we, where we use data generated by KR Biobank, they had shorter time spans than we did. And even though we used our models that we were taken for longer, longer time periods, they, they were working quite well on, on the samples that uh, KI Biobank had handled. So most likely the model holds fairly well, even for shorter times. Um, and so then do you have a recommendation for what the best time, the best time for handling plasma samples for O-Link? Uh, as soon as possible <laughs> after sampling and freezing as quickly as possible would be my answer. I'm going to just put myself. <laughs> the, 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 but the most important thing I would say is to do the same thing for all your, all your samples. So if you have longer handling time and it's all done consistently uh, for all your samples, then probably you still could draw fairly good conclusions. But if it varies between your the samples that you are comparing, then you have problems. And obviously the best is to do it as quickly as possible because after all, what we're after is what it is like in the body, which would be as soon as possible after sampling is when we can measure it. 
one can also mention that if you if you don't have the possibility to just spin and freeze your samples directly i mean putting them in a fridge mm. at that, top floor, yeah. that will help yeah. enormously with the leakage of proteins yeah. so um that's the shortcut but yeah mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. And then now question to uh, Sandra. Um, is there like, they would like to know how to do the disease model module identification and validation by disease enrichment that you presented. What would be a good resource to get started? Uh, well, I just actually sent the, in the chat, but we have a, a package of, of different module uh, methods um, in R. Um, so I would uh, suggest to, to look into that. Mm -hmm. And then there are also, I mean, Mika Gustafsson, who's the PI that I work with, he works a lot with disease modules, so there are a lot of reviews. Uh, and also Barabasi, who kind of coined the term disease modules, that's also a good, um, a good name um, to look for. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, and then a next uh, question also to you. When measuring inflammatory changes in plasma versus CSF, how do you interpret if the changes are due to inflammation in the CNS or in the periphery? I mean, that, that's uh, super difficult, uh, I mean, to say. Um, I think that's why most people, uh, a lot of people have looked in the cerebrospinal fluid because it should more accurately represent what's going on there. Um, but we know there is also like leakage from the CSF into the, into the periphery. Uh, but then it's also very difficult to say what is what, then there's probably also events taking place in the periphery, maybe before you get, for example, a relapse uh, in the CNS. So I would say that it's very um, difficult. Maybe Ingrid has, has more to comment on that. Um, but I think it would be difficult to say whether it comes from the CNS or if it's measuring something in the periphery. I mean, we tend to think that most of the relevant changes are in the CSF. Uh, but yes, as you pointed out, there are changes also in the periphery. So it's probably a combination of the two. And also what you measure in the peripheries is probably leaked out from CSF uh, in the case of MS. So it's mirroring the same thing. Just, I have a follow up. Do they correlate closely, the CSF and the plasma markers of inflammation? Maybe depends for some markers it correlates and for other markers it doesn't. Yes, we, we have uh, investigated that a bit and we see that there are some markers that correlate quite well and that most do not correlate well at all between CSF and, and plasma actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ingrid, can I follow up with you? I have a question myself. Um, does your model work for uh, plasma taken from pediatric uh, cohorts? I would think so, but I'm not, I have not tested that. We did not, I mean, we had too few samples to check carefully the effect of age, but um, so far we have not detected that there's a problem with age. But then most of our samples are individuals who are between 30 and 50. So not really in the pediatric cohort. But I can't see really why it should be a big difference, actually. Okay. Um, okay, well, we have a couple minutes left. If there's any other questions who haven't been answered, please feel free to raise your voice or if any of the panel have anything else they would like to add. Okay, if not, um, I guess, Mickey, we had said that we were going to have a five minute of wrap up and I guess I hand it back over to you. Yeah, now I've got 20 minutes. So that's point all your ears, please. No, uh, just thank all of the speakers and Jessica for, for making this the best afternoon so far this week. Um, it was really interesting to hear all of you, all of your different angles on, on this topic. Uh, the Eolink Explore at SciLife Explore Lab, it was actually a part of a multi-omics um, uh, approach to, to diseases. And um, we hope that the next time that we come back and have a seminar like this, perhaps we can have a little bit more on multi-omics and, and see how we can combine Eolink Explore with other omic technologies. Frederick was a little bit uh, showing data on that, but... Um, 
but there is much more to show and uh, the, the whole PQTL field is, is really interesting as well. So, but so keep tuned for the next uh, seminar. Uh, and for now, uh, we just want to say thank you. Yes. And thank you again to all of the speakers. Very good uh, talks from all of you.